Good morning, ladies and gentlemen in the virtual audience, regardless of where you are. It gives me great pleasure as the acting director of the Sartre Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies on the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies to welcome you to what we consider to be the first of the Salises Visitors webinar. This is a webinar series that I have envisioned for Salises to lead. And for various reasons, we have not been able to get it off the ground until today. So this inaugural Salises Visitors webinar is going to be the first of its kind. And we have none other but my colleague and friend, Mr. Hayden Gittins, who will be the inaugural speaker in this series. And I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Gittins to this event. As many of you will know, Salises over the past two years has been engaged in a number of outreach events that have implications for development studies knowledge generation, and at the same time, we, we, we address issues that have serious policy implications in the arena of the setting development agendas. And this is what Salesis is all about. It's a development studies uh, unit within the University of the West Indies located on the three original campuses and we do not only engage in graduate instruction and research, but we also pursue and are righteously engaged in consultancy efforts geared toward championing development causes within the Caribbean region. So far, within Salises St. Augustine, we have hosted 19 virtual Salises forums, each of which has had approximately six speakers. And these forums have crisscrossed a number of critical domains within development studies, whether they treat with the social, the economic, the administrative, governance-oriented, environmental issues, you name it, sociopolitical, geopolitical issues, you name it. Salises has touched on it. And we have a wide array of video recordings that you can find on our YouTube channel, focusing and presenting to all of you the myriad uh, discourses that have been entertained and been part of our virtual Salises forum series. We have done 19 to date, and we are very proud of that achievement. With respect to our six formers webinar, we have had two so far on the life and works of Sir Arthur Lewis, Nobel Laureate, 1979 in economics. And as many of you would be aware, our institute is named after the Nobel Laureate, Sir Arthur Lewis. So whenever his birthday arrives and is celebrated, in January of each year, Salises embarks upon a number of critical projects that would celebrate his life. And the Sixth Formers webinar is a fitting tribute to the legacy of Sir Arthur Lewis insofar as we are making our effort to ensure that the next generation of Caribbean actors, Caribbean academics, Caribbean scholars, Caribbean policy makers they are fully aware of the works of Sir Arthur Lewis and come to terms with the implications of such works in this day and age and in the next few years when they themselves would be championing the causes of development efforts within the Caribbean region. We usually have four schools from Trinidad, and, from Trinidad one from Tobago, and one from a country, a, Car a CARICOM member state outside of Trinidad and Tobago. And this has been a successful effort on behalf of the Sartre Lewis Institute. 
we have also had what we call our spotlight lecture series and our spotlight lecture series features Salisis academics who actually give keynote addresses on topics and research areas consistent with their research interests. And to date, we have had eight such spotlight lectures. And all of these can be found on our website. You can go to our website, visit our website, and find all of these uh, presentations one after the other. And before today's proceeding ends, I shall make every effort to ensure that we send the address of the, 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 the links to these uh, efforts so that you can access them. So we have been doing our part in terms of outreach, and we trust that by virtue of the attendance we witness every time we do this, that the various publics, whether in Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean region, or even beyond the Caribbean region, we have had, uh, we have had attendees from as far as Australia, India, Pakistan, and a number of such, number of such places. We trust that you really appreciate what we have been doing and you continue to join and participate in our proceedings. So as I said, today is the first of our Salises Visitors webinar. And we are pleased to have Mr. Hayden Gittins who will be speaking on the subject, private financing for economic development in the Caribbean. And insofar as Mr. Gittins has graciously uh, agreed to be the first and inaugural speaker, in the, 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 the first speaker in this inaugural event, Salises Visitors Webinar, I would like and I take great pleasure in introducing Mr. Griffith, uh, Mr. Gittins, sorry, by uh, just going through his bio. And his bio reads as follows. Mr. Gittens has had over 30 years of experience in the financial sector, having represented various institutions at a senior level throughout the Caribbean. He started his banking career at Republic Bank Limited, then spent over 23 years representing the RBC Royal Bank Group in Trinidad and Tobago and in Jamaica ultimately attaining the position of group head corporate banking. In 2013, he was appointed the chief executive officer of the Bank of St. Lucia Limited, a position he held for three years. He was then appointed to the position of chief executive officer of the Trinidad and Tobago Securities and Exchange Commission, a position he held between August 2017 and July 2020. At present, he provides business consultancy services for small and medium-sized establishments and large enterprises in Trinidad and Tobago. A highly qualified executive, Mr. Gittens has over the years led and managed teams in competitive and results-oriented environments throughout the region. His areas of expertise include commercial and corporate banking, credit risk management, securities regulation and business and financial consultancy. He holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of Manchester, UK, as well as a Master of Science in Accounting and a Bachelor of Science Honours in Industrial Management both from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. So that's the biographical sketch, short but sweet, of Mr. Gittens. And on a personal note, I would just like to say that I have known Mr. Gittens for the past 50 plus years. We entered Trinity College in, in Mocha in the first form back in 1970, and we have been friends and colleagues since then. 
I am fully aware of Mr. Gittins' academic attributes. He scaled all of the standards that were expected of students who attended Trinity College back in the 1970s. And I was on campus with Mr. Gittins when we were at the St. Augustine campus during the late 1970s. I'm aware of his scholarly attributes and his intellectual capabilities. I am aware of the fact that when he did his master's degree in accounting, he was among those at the top of the class in the master's in accounting. And I'm fully aware of his achievements beyond the master's of in accounting as his bio has indicated with respect to his achievements in the banking and financial sector, not only here in Trinidad and Tobago, but in the Caribbean region. Mm -hmm. And just recently, I witnessed his uh, article in the Business Guardian, and upon noting it, I thought it was a fitting uh, piece that could have been, that could be presented in a forum that Salises le leads and I felt that I would have been, I would like to invite him, and he graciously obliged. So uh -huh. Mr. Gittins is one of my together brothers, as we would say. And I wish to invite Mr. Gittins to begin his presentation. Mr. Gittins, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you for graciously obliging to make this presentation at our inaugural Solisis Visitors Webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. St. Bernard. Uh, it is indeed a, a, a privilege um, to be invited by Solisis and, and by yourself to lead uh, this initiative. So I am, I am honored uh, to, be, to be chosen to be the first one and hopefully um, I can get uh, this particular uh, set of lectures going with a, with a bang. Um, first of all, let me just share my screen because I do have a presentation and um, that will that will kind of guide our discussions on on the on the issue of private finance in, in the region. So just to kind of give um, attendees a, a sort of background to the to the to the to the presentation today, I was um, commissioned by the IDB IDB Invest in particular late last year into early this year to do a, a Caribbean study of the private equity ecosystem. So um, much, if not all, of the information that's provided in in in, in our discussion today um, would the information that came out of that uh, out of that study. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure how many of the attendees, I, I suspect most of you are familiar with what private equity is. Um, but just to kind of give put it in perspective, um, entities that are now um, commonly that dominate the international stock stock market, uh, that are now common needs in terms of huge business uh, and futuristic business interests internationally. Uh, entities like Apple, for example, Alphabet, which is the parent of Google, Amazon, um, all the Elon Musk companies, Tesla, SpaceX, Twitter, which is now um, known as X, even Uber would have started off as concepts um, um, some of them in the in, in the garages of their of their sponsors, but as concepts, they would have had difficulty approaching the traditional financial sector for financing and support. Um, so, angel investors, venture capitalists, private equity, and private debt issuers basically stepped in and provided the seed capital for these companies and. And basically funded them to where they are now, which are huge, huge 
um, companies that dominate the international stock exchanges. And uh, the private equity ecosystem internationally is, is uh, there, there are quite a number of companies that are engaged in, 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 in private equity, private finance, and some of the more common place names would be uh, the Blackstone Group, KKR, or CBC Capital Partners, the Carlyle Group. A lot of them listed and registered in the U.S. and in Delaware as, as the state of choice in the U.S. These companies collectively control trillions of, 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 of capital, which it which is, which is, which is goes towards funding um, enterprises all over the world. So it's in the U.S. and in developed markets, it's quite a mature and well-established market. Uh, um, uh, market and activity. Um, and in fact, there have been several private equity players operating within this region, meaning the Caribbean and Latin America, for quite some time. So even in the Caribbean, it's a relatively long standing but um, uh, industry that sort of operates below the surface and provides seed capital for a lot of the, the, the businesses that. Um, cannot be supported by the, or, or sufficiently supported by the traditional banking sector. Of course, you can't talk about private financing and private equity and private debt without touching on some of the controversies. So in the US, there, there's, a, there's a perspective that says uh, a lot of the private financing uh, activity um, funds hostile takeovers and private equity is going, uh, companies going to, going to, um, invest in companies and, and strip them and, and sell them to the highest profit and so on. So there's a, a, a point of view that, that strongly argues that there are negatives associated with private equity, but there's no doubt that um, substantially private equity, because of the sheer volume of funds that is, that is, that is available and that is managed by, 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 by these entities, um, meaning trillions, there's no doubt that they have supported and continue to support in a very tangible way the growth and development initiatives within developing and developed uh, economy. And more than that, um, as we will go to later on in, the, in this discussion, because their intervention in bravery leads to closer oversight and closer um, intervention to improve company performance, that also has provided a fillip to, 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 to in, in developing um, uh, countries and, and companies, and by extension, developing economies throughout the world. So I think net net the impact of the private equity space has been positive for, 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 for uh, both the local, the regional, and the international economies and, and jurisdiction. So I uh, kind of provided some short notes on, on what, what private financing is. It's essentially a pooling of the investors' funds towards the acquisition of ownership interest in, in the case of private equity. And this private equity can be in the form of common or preference or convertible shares or any type of security. There, there are any number of, of options there. Private debt, which is another aspect of private financing, would be non-public debt issued to a company. And private denotes a transaction that is not traded on a public exchange, not issued for public purchase. Um, so let me kind of contrast. So let me kind of spell out, for example, a company X needed financing may approach the bank. Um, and when you line up uh, bank financing as against private equity financing, they are positives and negatives. If you are if you have a good relationship with your banker and have what is required to obtain financing, it can a bank transaction, a bank funded transaction invariably will be less costly and faster and certainly less intrusive. Um, but of course, you have to have a good relationship with your banker. So you need a financing, a financial, good financial track record. You need to have um, collateral and, you know, at the end of the day, because that's how banks operate prudentially, they, they need a second source of payment if things don't work out. Um, and 
banking bank finance would would ultimately have a, a limit because banks lend uh, uh, lending policy is guided by sector exposures. So to the extent that you reach the limit of sector exposures, they will they will they will no longer be able to finance you. Um, if you touch on a public issue, for example, a, 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 a listing on a securities exchange, a public securities exchange by an initial public offering and or so on, um, the, it, it, it opens you up to a much larger sea of financing. But of course, that um, that is a for, for, for most companies a, a costly um, proposition. Um, it's a lengthier proposition to, 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 to get to the point where you list. It's um, potentially and generally more, uh, com uh, more, more complicated because, of course, you have to prepare certain documents, among them a, a, a very detailed prospectus on your, on, your, on your issue. And then, of course, listing on a stock exchange comes with uh, requires reporting requirements. So there's some pretty rigorous reporting requirements around listing. So a lot of the companies that um, may require financing that may be viable may not be ready for public listing because of those those issues. Most companies, when they they set up, they 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 um, uh, they benefit from friends and family private financing. Um, but of course, there's a limit to that, and invariably, this that that private financing uh, is not able to. Um, carry the company up to full growth, and that's the, the issue with that aspect of private because that is private equity, but it's but it's limited. Um, so that private funding, whether it's, uh, debt or, 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 or equity funding, by its very nature, after you've gone through the rigors of obtaining funding um, from private investors, tends to be more patient. It tends to be appropriately structured because there's deeper understanding of what the business needs and the and the kind of type of funding and financing that would work for the business. And in most of these instances, the investors have a, a better understanding of a, a, a more comprehensive understanding of the business. So, and that helps in terms of in terms of being able to to ensure that there's support from. From, from the investors as you go through the challenges associated with with, with, with business. So that kind of outlines the sort of differences and the options available to private investors. Let me kind of go into the so-called private equity, private financing ecosystem. And this applies, of course, internationally and also to the to the to the Caribbean. So one of the first players is an entity called the investment advisor. That this 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 entity invariably would be a a, a, a regulated financial institution, i.e., a bank or or a bank banking subsidiary that is regulated by both the central bank in the various countries and the Securities and Exchange Commission. So it's a tightly regulated entity, and in addition to providing investment advice. As part of its 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 services, more importantly, this 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 entity is the one that sort of is at the um, uh, the administrative heart of the private private financing space. So it provides the necessary custodial and administrative services um, that 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 are required. Uh, and by custody, I mean um, custody of the um, fund allocations, custody of share certificates. If, if physical or electronic shift certificates are, 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 are prepared, we um, being responsible for communicating with investors and for ensuring that reporting, financial reporting and, and fund performance reporting takes place. So this is the entity that's 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 responsible for that. And basically the private equity firm um, through a legal agreement. Because there's their legal agreements that wrap all of the activities in this this very structured, very 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 um, systematic um, ecosystem, and the private equity firm basically um, one of the first asks is to is to is to engage an investment advisor in a legal um, sense. 
for the private equity firm, and I'll, I'll provide more details on what the private equity firm does to fit in its, its, its fee. Um, uh, has a legal agreement with the investment advisor. And in the industry parlance, in the private equity firm, is called the general partner. Right? So the, 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 the third important element to this are, are what I call the investors, the limited partners. And uh, the investors may be uh, institutions, i.e. institutional investors, family firms, meaning wealthy family firms of which there are many throughout the Caribbean, high net worth, net worth individuals, um, collective investment schemes, which is the technical word for mutual fund. May also be credit unions, um, if, 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 if they are, have interest and have the, the risk profile to, to invest in that. And the arrangement between the private equity firm and the investors is also a, a rigidly established legal one. So there's a legal agreement and the investors, especially if they are in the, the FI, Development Financial Institutions like the IDB, ISC, the, the, uh, the CDB, uh, un, they, they, they undertake rigorous due diligence assessment of the private equity firm um, before agreeing to invest, and the agreements between the, the both parties uh, are informed by, 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 by pretty well established legal agreement. And by the same token, um, the private equity firm does due diligence on the, on the, on the investor, basically uh, ensuring that, that, that uh, all the issues around anti-money laundering, for example, and anti terrorism finance and all of that, all of that, there's, there's comfort and, and, and uh, assurance with respect to that. So again, the legal web is pretty tight between the, the party and the other entity, of course, is the private equity fund. And the private equity fund basically is the fund that, 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 that does the investment um, and owns the shares in the invest, investment. It, it's it's uh, invariably 100% owned by the private equity firm and it's a separate legal entity. And of course, over time, based on the investment policy and profile of the private equity firm, for the private equity firm, they say, look, I am limiting my investments to um, renewables, to tourism, to construction, to local, to housing, um, so that the investments and the portfolio kind of evolves in line with the investment policy of the of, of the fund over time, and uh, and and basically um, this investment portfolio grows and uh, investments come out when when they when you exit and, and investments come in when when you add to the investor and that in a nutshell um summarizes the private equity ecosystem um and and, and it's kind of uh, duplicated um across the caribbean in terms of the transaction so the bottom line is that this is a this is not an ad hoc arrangement this is a very structured um um, arrangement and, and 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 structure, and it's and it's tied together by by very tight legal agreements, and there's clarity on in the investment uh, mm -hmm. policy and profile, and there's clarity on the rules of the of the various individuals. So, just to touch on the on the on the on the process of the of the risk assessment before I go on. Um, so the, 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 there is a rigorous risk assessment that, 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 that accompanies the whole process of adding up a, a portfolio company to the, to the, to the, to the portfolio of, of, of uh, investments. And the risk assessment is, I would say, as I said, pretty, pretty rigorous. It, it, it's, it, you, you, there's a financial aspect to the risk assessment where historical performance, projections, the capital structure, tax accounting for the, for the, for the firm, um, the debt profile, all of those are rigorously examined and, and so on. There is examination of the products and markets that they, that they, that the uh, prospective invest, investing company is, is, is operating in. There is, um, assessment of the customers and distributors and suppliers, the, the immediate relationship between the customers, distributors and suppliers, and indeed the competitive landscape and where the company sits in the competitive landscape. 
there is a pretty rigorous assessment of the marketing uh, strategy and sales and distribution strategy of the of the investing company. Uh, if if the investing company engages in, in engages in R and D, there is um, rigor around assessing the R and D approach of the company, and of course there is extensive assessment of the management and personnel of the of the investing company. Um, and again, there is there is all the all the legal um, issues are, uh, around the portfolio companies are examined whether their legal liabilities, the impact on the environment, um, any intellectual property protections, uh, any uh, uh, the the level of insurance protection, any issues that the company may have with regulatory institutions. So all of that kind of goes into the whole process of adding portfolio companies. So it is it is pretty rigorous. I would say it's more intrusive than your uh, your your typical bank loan. But the important thing is um, the 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 investor is is uh, is either has access to or is personally very familiar with the industry, so that the the analysis and assessment is sensible from that perspective, and there isn't a requirement for collateral in most of these transactions. Even for debt financing, the, 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 the debt structures, um, uh, uh, debt is extended with the knowledge that there are uh, bank investors who are ahead of the game. So the, the debt structures tend to be uh, very creative, trade financing, in, invoice factoring, and so on. And so that the requirement for hard collateral is, is, is not there. And basically, that 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 kind of summarizes the whole process and and summarizes the the, the accumulation of portfolio companies. So I'll go into what the private equity does, and the private equity firm basically, on average, earns a, a fee equal to two percent of the total value of the fund, and of course, a twenty percent um, fee. On exits, so in other words, the value of the company when when it exits, the the the, the, the private equity firm uh, owns twenty percent of the value. The investors, the limited partners, own eighty percent. Um, so, and what does the private equity firm to do to earn to uh, do to, to earn that? Well, quite a lot. And let me just indicate that. Um, most private equity firms tend to be very small organizations. So the 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 the, the way they organize is that they um, for specialist expertise they bring in parties or, or specialists in various areas who provide advisory services um, and they commission them on a short term basis or they keep them on, on retainer. Um, but the, the core private equity firm or private financing firm tends to be a small organization. So it's a very fluid, very um, efficiently structured organization. So if, you know, if the first important responsibility of the private equity firm would relate to investor engagement and fundraising. So they engage investors to ensure funding takes place. They uh, ensure that as investors come in, the, the, the administrative systems and structures uh, as provided by the investment advisor are rigorous and meet all the requirements in terms of custody and equity and, and, and equity and debt payments and so on. So, so, so they ensure that that takes place and they manage the fundraising function. Of course, the, 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 the key thing in terms of the, the activities of of, of private financing is building the deal so building the deal pipeline. So, and that involves engaging any number of players in the market, consultants, financiers, development, financial institutions, micro financial institutions, all with the aim of building the pipeline of, of, of funding ready uh, um, investing company. Um, it involves a lot of a lot of work in, in, in terms of doing that. And of course, one of the more substantial sort of responsibilities relates to ensuring SME uh, uh, companies, in particular, the readiness of those those SME com companies, ensuring that these companies evolve into viable.
private financing candidates. The big area, um, it's a challenging area, of course, in our, in, uh, particularly in our region, but throughout the world. So, that, uh, you know, they're responsible for origination and building the deal flow. Um, at the end of the day, when you have a deal in, in place, you have to do, you have to evaluate the deal to, 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 to ensure viability. You have to do the due diligence on the company and on the principles. You have to do the research on the industry to ensure that when you add a company to the to the portfolio and the pipeline of, of portfolio companies, the investment thresholds are met and so on. So all of the com pretty comprehensive due diligence is, is conducted by the, by the uh, private equity either directly or using consultants. Um, the, the fourth element, important element, is related to the deal structure because the idea is to structure a transaction that benefits both the investee and the investor and is, an, uh, and is sensible for both. Um, there's it, it, the, the whole issue of company and investee valuation tends to be a controversial one. So a lot of time is spent on arriving at a value that is acceptable to both parties and is it's fair and realistic and of course in structuring the transaction you have to ensure that look there will it, you know you have to structure it to ensure that uh the exit at the end of the five or seven or ten years when the investor um is seeking to come out of the transaction that can be done smoothly so that so that whole deal structuring area is a very important aspect of it and for many of these investee companies in the portfolio um, there is there may be a requirement for hands-on involvement. So invariably, there's board representation for, for private equity deals um, by the uh, private equity firms or representatives of the private equity firm. And dependent on the level of strength and weakness of the of the private of the portfolio company, the um, the level of intervention, the level of involvement at the board level would be either be stronger or or, or, or less so, um, because the aim is to ensure that the valuation multiple of the of the company is higher, much higher, or higher um, than at the time of, of of investment, so that when you when the, when the, when the company is sold, it's a higher value company, and of course. Uh, that goes to the 20 and 28 is split on the on the on the on the sale value at the end of the day. And of course the 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 the, the last important area really is to the exit manage, management. Um, so uh, invariably um, private equity funds and investors have a kind of investment um, timeline of maybe five years, maybe seven years, maybe 10 years. But at the end of that period, the, the the responsibility of the PE firm is to, is to is to ensure that the most appropriate, effective, and remunerated remunerated exit strategy is arrived at. That involves engaging agencies that 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 impact that whole process of exit regulators, service providers, attorneys, accountants, and so on. So that whole process of exit is is is, is closely managed by the private equity firm. And this basically is how the 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 the, the, the rational for the twenty twenty the, the two by twenty split in terms of the fee income. All right. So I will move on to the requirements for the development of a robust private financing sector. And of course, the first relates to the state of the economy. Um, the stronger the economy, of course, the higher the potential. So in a in a in a Caribbean context, um one may see that the stronger economies, the, the larger economies, uh, uh Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, um would have higher potential for development of a private financing sector and a capital market development. That in some instances, haven't actually been the, been, been the case, but um, you know, in really that's 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 a requirement. Uh, of course, the level of investor sophistication and investor risk appetite. So, that to the extent that investors uh, have higher knowledge and, and sophistication, then that pushes development of the private financing sector. 
And by the same token, the degree of investing awareness, sophistication, and the degree of financing demand. So again, I bring up the term of investing readiness, um, meaning you are at a stage where you your your company in terms of its 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 structure, its 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 policy is ready for to be a, a viable and attractive investment um, um, opportunity for an investor. And you are in a position to sell all your company's strengths. So readiness relates to both the company and the principal's readiness to sell the company's strength. And that's a big area and a big, a, a pretty challenging area um, for in the in the in the in the uh, in the Caribbean and particularly in the less developed uh, markets in the Caribbean. I have kind of highlighted in red the areas that I will kind of touch on in more detail later, later on in the presentation. But of course, the level of development of the capital market, the depth of the capital market, so active and deep securities exchanges and bond markets um, with, with secondary trading taking place because investors want more predictability around their ability to exit. You know, you won't go into something with a with a five, seven or ten year um, timeline if you have some reasonable if you don't have some reasonable assurance that you will be able to, to, to come out and come out at a profit at the end of the day. Um, the degree of regulatory and legislative sophistication, oversight, and support. So all the regulations and legislation that support business activity, the company that securities, um, act the insurance, at the pension funds, intellectual property protection for companies, insolvency legislation would provide protection for companies to the extent that those are up to date um, and that the, and regulators and legislators understand uh, the impact of these of these uh, fields of legislation on the sector that would assist with the development of the of the sector. Of course, the, an adequate pool of experience and competent sector service providers. So that includes attorneys, accountants, investment advisors, financial advisors, including banks, organization and governance experts, among other service providers. Very important in terms of uh, assisting with the development of the of the of the of the of the uh, private financing sector. A lot of reliable exit opportunities, IPOs, management buyouts, shareholder buybacks, strategic investors, bank financing, cash flow, other private equity firms, larger private equity firms that are willing to take up uh, investments. So to the extent that that exists, that, 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 that would drive the, the sector. Um, the whole impact of business incubators and accelerators, and I'll kind of touch on that later, but they kind of help in the development of new business and, and help the growth of existing businesses to the extent that, that those entities exist. Um, it helps in the whole process of private finance and development. And of course, high in a, a period of high interest rates on, on this and past for all investment activity, high interest rates to investments in both in the public and, and private sphere. So um, to the extent that interest rates are low or stable, that 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 is it. Now what has happened in the region is that um I would say that capital market development generally has been limited and certainly uneven. So in the larger economies as I said, so Jamaica stands out in terms of capital market development. And some distance behind would be uh, Trinidad. Dominican Republic has made some big strides in that area, but they don't have much, for example, they don't have much activity on their on their securities exchanges. Um, but generally, most of the other jurisdictions, capital market development is limited. It's not as it's not as uh, not as ex extensive as, as as should be the the, the, the case. So. What I'm going to touch on is, is the market development side, the whole area of, of market development. And as you can see, Jamaica has 70 um, listings on the on the G dollar exchange, 20 listings on the US dollar exchange. And some of these 20 may be within the 70, and two listings on their bond exchange. They have as many as 48 
it has been done the SME exchange and uh, 16, at least 16 private equity um, uh, and private credit firms. So kind of way ahead of the rest of the uh, the region, Trinidad um, has less listings. The SME exchange hasn't been that successful. Um, there uh, they are a number of uh, private equity and, and credit firms, but not as much as Jamaica. There's a fair amount of family firm activity within wealthy family firms who control businesses or conglomerates that have been active in 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 in, in, in uh, mergers and acquisition, especially over the last five to ten years. Um, but that takes place quietly. And then as you go down the road, it's it's kind of even though there are many listings, not much activity on the exchanges. Um, the DR has um, nine list uh, registered fund managers. They've gone so far to register their fund managers. They have a fair amount of foreign activity in the in the in the private equity private financing space, and they have a multiplicity of of, of local family firms. Now. Let me kind of highlight and touch on Jamaica and Trinidad and kind of carry you back to the 1990s. So uh, between 1990 and 2000, Jamaica experienced uh, the financial sector meltdown. The indigenous banking sector, um, with the exception of, I guess, N NCB, literally disappeared from the from the from the from the uh, banking space in, in, in Jamaica. And it, a lot of the banks were acquired by FinSAC. Um, why this happened for a lot of reasons, high interest rates, um, weak economy, um, weak oversight, uh, high delinquency, poor management, poor governance, um, any number of, 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 of reasons. Um, but what, what, what happened as a result of that, the consequence of that was that you had a lot of a lot of especially middle-sized businesses that were literally under or unbanked because the banks that were supporting them no longer existed and that created a vacuum that could that wasn't filled by by by, by the banks that that we mean the international banks for the social business Caribbean, the city banks and so on retreated from the from the from the financial markets also because of the, the circumstances but that created an opportunity for the evolution of um, angel investors and their capitalists, private equity, they stepped into that space and they provided financing for, for businesses. Um, what exacerbated it in Jamaica, of course, was that they come at the time, this was pre IMF um, intervention. The, the Jamaica government dominated and called, called it out the financial sector. So they, they were uh, deficit financing, issuing securities that were often very high yield. And investors were attracted to that, and 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 a lot of investors, uh, a heavy part of the investment portfolio was with Jamaica government uh, people. That kind of ended around middle to middle middle two thousand two thousand four two thousand five to 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 the present to be the with the, the uh, intervention of the IMF program and the debt restructure. You know, what happened with Jamaica? Um, extended their debt profile, they reduced the interest rates compulsorily, they, uh, and they were forced to, to, move, to, to move away from deficit budget budgeting. So what happened over time is that the, the, the level of government securities in the market kind of reduced substantially over that period. And investors who, who, and who had grown up and grown used to investing in government paper had no were looking around for an alternative high yield investment. And that also created a split in terms of providing financing, private equity type venture capital financing. So that is high yield people um, for, for, for these investors. Um, so that further increased the, the population of, 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 of uh, private financing in, 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 in that position, ironically. So Around 2012, 20, 2011, between 2011 and 2013, the Jamaica, the, the junior stock exchange was, 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 was uh, 
introduced. And that was an immediate success because remember you have a you have a set of private equity investors looking for exit. And and you have companies looking for financing that uh, that couldn't be provided by the uh, traditional commercial banks and you had a, a, a prevailing high interest rate environment. So that is kind of what led to a situation where you have 48 companies being listed on the SME and a lot of activity. So uh, private equity players ex use that to, to, to exit. And bottom line is that whole period of financial crisis hardened, in my view, hardened the investment and risk appetite and investment profile of, 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 of the players involved in, 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 in investment activity and private equity investment and, and so on in Jamaica. And as I say, ironically kind of provided the 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 the, the, the pillar to, to develop in the sector to where it is now. Um a number of the, the, the companies that are listed on the Juno Juno stock exchange of course would have graduated to the main stock exchange to further uh, you know grow in the activity in, in that area. And of course, there were entities like the DBJ um, that that intervened. DBJ in Jamaica was and continues to be a market maker and it works with the, in, the international uh, DFI, the IDB, the IFC, and so on to, to push the growth of, of alternative financing and, 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 and uh, private financing. Uh, so the DBG plays a very, very important role, and the DBG is a good study in terms of uh, that type of intervention. Government set up, but basically the, the Jamaica government um, wisely uh, staffed with competent uh, people and uh, provided the funding when required, and then stepped away to allow the uh, DBG and the private sector to develop the, 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 the activity. And and that basically entities like the DBJ would have would have would have really assisted in the whole process of development of the private equity. So, so let's contrast that with Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so Trinidad's story is that of course the venture capital program is I would describe it as stillborn. Even the Tobago House of Assembly venture capital company, which still exists, has. I would say not been particularly successful in terms of its 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 its, its objective, and I always look at the role of the unit trust corporation, uh, which I mean the argument is that of course it would have mobilized and and encouraged saving within the within the country by the man on the street. You raise out of that. Um, Unit Trust has over 650,000 customers. The, I argue that the one of the side effects of the Unit Trust is that is that it's tied to investor participation and risk capital. Because remember, Unit Trust for quite some time doesn't anymore, but for quite some time offered higher higher um, yields um, on. Basically, a safe investment, and to exacerbate that, for some time there were there were investors enjoyed tax benefits for investing in in, in bonds, and I think over time that created a, a risk aversion in the in the in the in the, uh, in the country that we still kind of uh, dealing with here, and that has to some extent um, worked against the development of the capital markets and the and the and the private financing sector and in particular it's partially responsible for the, the lack of success of the SME exchange to be one of the one of these not the only issue but it's one of these so the the, the that's Jamaica versus Trinidad and Tobago and, and that is my kind of theory on why Two relatively well developed economies in the Caribbean. Jamaica is, it's had had its challenges, but it's nurturing on. Have had a different sort of experience and history in terms of, in terms of the whole evolution of alternative financing. Um, Barbados, of course, narrow business sector, lots of barriers to entry, 
the Bahamas, the challenges that the on, on offshore sector dominates the onshore sector, despite, despite the fact that there are many incentives to development of the capital market that have been really taken off. Um, Ghana, long history of the development and economic challenges, but Ghana is a new frontier. And they are going to need alternative financing to support the nominal growth that, that lies ahead for, for Ghana. Um, the Dominican Republic, heavy, heavy government involvement legislatively and so on to support the sector, and that has, I think, uh, propelled the sector in the Dominican Republic. Um, he, he has had serious social and, and economic challenges, and that continues. And of course, Renan, the reason is to prevent the challenges that those, those, those are. Those, those are the kind of low stage of development and so on. So they um, have some way to go, even though they all have exchanges and so on. They have some, they have some way to go to develop viable um, private equity and capital markets and so on. In Central Bien, interestingly, has, has updated its, its mutual fund registration and there, there's one entity that's, that's, um, that's put out a mutual fund. So we'll see how that, how that goes. So, the market, that's what I say when I say undue development in the region, and there are some theories as to why there is that development. So let me move on to the legislative and regulatory situation. And the key thing is you want updated legislation that recognizes new forms of financing, that uh, recognizes the existence of parties that that engage in, in, in non-public financing and protects those parties that you want the securities regulator to 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 to, to uh, recognize the existence of uh, same recognition recognize the existence of of of, uh, of private financing but create room for the for the development of, of the private financing sector in their legislation and in their activities you want strong insolvency like legislation because as companies grow and so on, they, they, you want to, you want them to be assured that they that they that they have the support of the legislation as they go through their challenges, and you want strong intellectual property legislation so that people understand um, and, and are assured that their ideas and concepts will be stolen, and they have options if that takes place and so on. So Jamaica has done a lot of work in terms of updating its its, its legislation. Uh, there is specific recognition of the existence of, of general and limited partners. Um, they have updated the threshold for investment by uh, and the major institutional investors that 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 should be given an opportunity to invest in these areas with the insurance companies because they have a huge amount of of, of policy of uh, uh, policy funds and pension funds. So to the extent that the insurance companies and the pension funds have uh, room and, and scope uh, to invest in higher risk investments, so you're talking about a small portion of their portfolio and you're talking about ensuring that they have the capability to do the risk assessment, that's 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 the kind of update you need on the legislation. Um, you have updated, you, if Jamaica has updated security regulation, they basically would have um, taken from the from the uh, Trinidad legislation and, and just customized it for their purposes. You also have updated insolvency and IP legislation. In Trinidad, of course, the legislation doesn't specifically recognize general, general and limited partners, but the, 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 the sector has operated notwithstanding that. Um, most of the the, the limited partners, general partners, are broker dealers um, and, 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 and registered and, and, and uh, over, have oversight by the PPD and exchange commission. So that that kind of works. Um, in Trinidad, the Insurance Act of 2018 sort of sort of updates the legislation to some extent and creates room for the insurance companies to invest in in in, in private uh, financing. But of course, the issue is that those are the most heavily weighted, risk weighted investments. So you really have to have a low risk, high yielded investment in the private equity space to qualify. 
And it's very difficult for companies without a track record to invest to, to, to source this type of funding because um, the uh, the requirement is for um, companies to have a, a dividend history and so on, or, or history that that indicates that they're capable of paying dividends. But that's the, the challenge. Um, Trinidad operates on 2014 securities. Uh, a, a 2012 to 2014 Securities Act, um, which doesn't specifically recognize private transactions. And uh, in the common in insolvency, it's 2007, but it's a very old law in terms of insolvency regulation. Um, and uh, it's a work in progress in terms of updating that. And then, of course, the IP legislation is was recently updated, but the issue with the uh, intellectual property is that companies are not aware of the protections. So there's for some communication there. As I said, lots of work done in the Dominican Republic. So you have registered funds, you have registered um, private equity entities, uh, either incorporated as trusts or otherwise, and they've updated all, all the other aspects of their legislation. Barbados, Ulo, the Bahamas, um, they've done some work in terms of uh, an in the investment funds act of 2018, which recognizes rec which which will recognize the existence of of investment funds. But as I mentioned, that that that, that economy and territory is an offshore based economy, so that's a challenge to get to, to kind of get um, the onshore um, sector. In, in in line, but that's that that's the problem. And a lot of the in a lot of the legislation is very very uh, to, to 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 private equity and private private debt. So some work required there. Ghana, lots of work to be done in terms of updating all this legislation, and that will be absolutely required, as, especially as they as they explode. So now we same story, Belize and Haiti. So those are the sort of challenges with the, with the legislative and regulatory activities of, in, within, within all of those jurisdictions. And just to touch on the, the in, in, incubators, accelerators, venture capitalists, that sort of history of development. In Jamaica, of course, I already touched on the activities of this, this development bank of Jamaica. And they have actually created an entity called the Caribbean Alternative Investment Association, CARAIA, which basically is a coming together of, 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 of most of the companies engaged in private financing in Jamaica and some in the region. We have about uh, just under 25 members or associates. And basically, the aim is to is to, to uh, uh, you know aid in the development of the sector, provides stats on the on the development on the, on the performance of the sector and so on. So we essentially, the act as a pillar for development of private private and also the financial in the region. Done a tremendous amount of work in that regard. But historically, the Branson Center, the first angels of Jamaica, the um, Montego Bay um, equivalent, the Montego Bay Angels, and of course the IDP and has been very active in Jamaica, and the Jamaica Business Development Corporation kind of in the early days, especially would have would have would have assisted in a lot of that activity. In terms of Bigo, of course, I mentioned the PHA Venture Capital Fund. There's an entity called Metro, which basically provides assistance to SMEs and so on, both financial and advisory. And then there's a more recently developed uh, partnership between the Ministry of Industry and Trade and the Unit Trust Corporation, which is Taylor PNP. So the jury is out on the impact of those interventions in Trinidad, um, the more recent interventions, that is. In the Dominican Republic, of course, there is the entity called the Dominican Association of Investment Fund Management Companies. So that's the, that, that's the umbrella company that, that, that uh, oversees the activities that they registered private equity uh, and private financing firms in the Dominican Republic. There's a lot of work in that regard. Barbados 10 Habitat has done some work there. In the Bahamas, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of intervention by the these entities, the Bahamas Central Propaneur Venture Fund, the Bahamas Development Bank, the IDB Business Charity Fund, small business 
development center women in South America initiative, which is a very recent initiative. Um, so a lot of intervention, but it's still a work in progress because um, uh, I guess of, of the offshore dominance. There's actually a cloud, cloud funding platform called ROX that has done some limited amount of funding in the Bahamas. Um, Ghana, like IDB Labs and IDB Investments is involved, but they, they, they still have to develop a viable sort of government supported development institution to um, encourage private financing. Suriname is the National Development Bank and IDB Labs. And Belize, IDB Invest is involved and they've involved, been involved actually directly funding a couple of viable projects there, but not enough activity in that jurisdiction. Of course, in Haiti, the focus is on social development, given the issues there. Uh, USAID is, is, is involved, IDB is involved. There's an entity called Profile, which is a uh, major private equity, private financing operation there and, and has been responsible for whatever legislative introductions that have taken place. So I just, I'll in closing, kind of provide some information on some of the players in the region. And you see in Trinidad, in Jamaica, a whole long list, in the Bahamas, in Barbados, in the Dominican Republic, there are nine entities, and you see among them GMSB that has an, a, a, a very active presence in the Dominican Republic. Um, there are entities that operate across the Caribbean, see uh, Portland, um, RBC does some transactions across the region, MPC Caribbean, which is the, uh, I think the only listed private um, financing entity in the region. CBB has done some within, within the region also. There are a couple of new funds that can come into the region, but, uh, and there, uh, as I mentioned, there are some names that are not here that will be to private firm, private family firm that own large businesses that are, that are actively engaged and continuously engaged in investing and so on. Um, but, you know, this kind of, in a nutshell, captures a lot of the very, very active Firms in this in this in this private equity private financial space, and at, during the course of the study, one of the questions I asked was, you know, related to potential areas for Caribbean private investment, and these are some of the options that kind of came out, and some of the countries that 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 uh, that, that you know uh, in, you know indicated these are the areas that they that they that they felt were good opportunity for private equity. You know, like manufacturing to export, agriculture, planning, food, renewable energy, fintech, mentech, the SME sector, the creative sector, logistics, education, and tech, indigenous food, infrastructure development, high-end real estate development, cannabis, actually in, in Jamaica, and more recently Barbados. So those are some of the sort of opportunities. Maybe share if you if you if you check out the list, a lot of them, because they are not they are not they 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 may be traditional industries, but they're not industries that have traditionally been heavily supported by the uh, financial traditional financial institution. Um, that's that's kind of where the opportunity for private financing comes in. These are futuristic industries. Um, all, all the all the uh, uh, talk around, around, uh, you know, diversifying economies and so on. A lot of these industries will be the industries that will be looked to, to to facilitate diversification. And so you have a kind of a, a ironic situation where traditional financing may not be best positioned to, to finance the economies that would best drive diversification. So that in a nutshell, and in closing, I will kind of summarize and reiterate what private financing can do in the region. Of course, it creates more funding opportunities for knowledge industry in the creative sector, fintech, edutech, SMEs, agriculture, agriculture, tourism, clean and low environmental impact energy. Um, it 
can provide more funding options for startup businesses and really businesses in, 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 in startups and SMEs that, that are having the most difficulty in accessing financing from traditional sources in our region. And generally, internationally, we provide more funding op op opportunities. It, as I mentioned in the last slide, it can assist countries towards achievement of their diversification imperative. It can facilitate the rebalancing of balance for over leverage businesses. Um, so to the extent that you can attract the private equity, um, you, you can you can recapitalize you your 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 balance sheet and make yourself more attractive for, for more financing as well as your, your growth objectives. It can contribute to the development of the regional capital markets. Um, so part of the one one major byproduct of intervention by a finance uh, by a private equity uh, company is strengthening of your operation by the oversight and by the intervention and so on. So you can conceive of a situation where with further activities, the private equity businesses across the region are stronger businesses. Of course, nothing prepares a company more for public listing than a private equity uh, transaction. Uh, so uh, that 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 says it all. Of course, an increasing level of financial participation of investors and investees, encouraging the goal of regional securities exchanges by end of increased listing and trading. Uh, it will also contribute to the creation of employment opportunities and skill set capacity building for industry service providers within each jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions have more um, supply of, of service providers than others. And across the board, it, 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 the capital activity and private financing is grown. You'll have more qualified fund managers, financial consultants, investment advisors, financial business analysts, and so on. So in, 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 as a whole, the, the capability and capacity of the region is increased. Um, of course, attract FBI to the region to the extent that they have a vibrant and active capital, um, capital markets and investment, um, private investment, FBI will certainly be attracted. And of course, uh, from the point of view of the state, encourage more public-private partnerships by partnerships between governments and and and, uh, and private entities to also assist in the diversification of of objectives. So, so, so that in a nutshell is the is the is the uh, presentation, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for the patience that you have you have shown. And I open up the and I open up the floor to 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 uh, questions and to further discussion on, on all that I have said. And so I thank you. I and I will stop the sharing at this stage and I will open up the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Gittins, for your presentation on private financing for economic development in Caribbean countries. And I would say that you did a fantastic job. Really appreciated the presentation. Um, clearly, you provided, you know, a definition of um, private financing, and beyond that definition, you went into looking at the different pri private financing options that are available. Additionally, you ventured into a discussion of the various markets, in particular the markets in the larger economies and um, providing a survey of you know private financing and the various options in those um, economies and you ended basically by looking at some implications and policy options as they relate 
to private financing as an instrument to facilitate economic development in Caribbean countries. So I'm very pleased with what I've heard this morning. As I said earlier in the introduction, this invitation grew out of the, 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 the Business Guardian article that you had written and it was displayed in the Business Guardian segment of the Guardian. And I can say that, you know, from what I've heard, it elaborates in to a much greater extent what would have been read given the limitations that would have been presented to you in writing an article in the newspaper. So thank you very much for clarifying a number of issues. And I am absolutely sure that, you know, there are members of the audience, the virtual audience, members who, who will have very interesting questions to ask of you. And I do not want to steal their thunder. So I want to remind everyone who is in the virtual audience that you can pose your questions in the chat. Um, we welcome your questions. Uh, Mr. Gittins has indicated an interest in responding to your questions. So do feel free to place them in the chat. I do apologize to some colleagues who might have had some um, mix up with the time, especially those in different time zones. I received one who said that he thought it was starting at 11 o'clock rather than 10 o'clock his time. So I think we, 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 we sort of um, might have misconstrued the scheduling for some. So my apologies. Or that. So I want to move straight into um, the questions. And the first question that I have comes from Hugo Ikimba, who is asking, are there any recognized venture capital funds in the Caribbean? I know that there are private equity funds. I do not know of any venture capital funds. Are there any venture capital funds in the Caribbean? Basically, that's the that's a question um, Hugo Ikim is asking. So at this point, I await other questions as they come forth, and I will ask uh, Mr. Gittins to respond to Mr. Ikimba. Yes, hi. Yes, thank you, uh, God, uh, Dr. Simonard, and um, and and uh, Hugo. Um, unfortunately, there, there is a, a, a present of a paucity of, of venture capital funds actually functioning in the, in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, I do know that the DBJ, um, up to when I was there in Jamaica in, in January, were in the process of establishing a, uh, a, a, a the, 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 the uh, so-called venture capital fund. I am not too sure how far they've reached with it because their approach is basically to see, see, provide seed funding and then and then get into um, the participation from, from other entities. I can I'll have to follow up there and so on. And maybe the information is available on their on their website. And I'm not too sure if anybody from the DBG is is, has a, is attending this this session. Um, I do not know of any other, strictly speaking, venture capital fund that 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 operates. As I mentioned, Trinidad would have had, um, uh, I would call them unsuccessful um, uh, experimentation with venture capital funds, um, and I'm not aware of in any other jurisdiction that 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 there is a structured venture capital fund available for startups and so on. So that's an opportunity, I guess, for, for, for a new fund. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Gittins, for, the, for that answer. And um, we can move right into the next set of questions. Um, one comes from Ms. Latoya Franklin. And according to Ms. Franklin, she says, Thanks, Hayden. Excellent presentation. 
Can you speak a bit more about the role of private financing in addressing climate financing challenges, especially in the region? Yeah, well, I mean, um, so most of the well-established ones, especially for the regional players, so um, I, I made mention of, 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 an, of, of, of seed financing, which is the only um, uh, private, um, or the publicly listed company, and that's that's a that's a a, a, a a fund that was specifically set up for uh, uh, providing funding for sustainable projects in the region. Um, so 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 there is, and, and most of the the the, the funds. Um, that have uh, currently established in the region, and in particular the Caribbean funds, have a high element of climate, climate uh, resilience and, and, and environmental impact uh, elements to their to their to their to their funding mix. Um, Sajikor, for example, has a I think it may be a ten million US fund, which is specifically and primarily geared to supporting projects. That, uh, uh, that that have a, a positive environment, environmental impact. Um, so, and I know that, uh, and the answer group has, uh, perhaps in a less structured way, provided funding support to um, a, a number of in, uh, environmental projects across the region and so on. So there's a fair amount of money going into um, not enough to, 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 because you're talking about multi millions of, of dollars that, that, that go into establishing climate resilience and, and disaster resilience and so on. Um, so, so, they're, they're, you know, so there are entities and, and invariably any fund that, is, that has a DFI. As as in an IDB or, a, or an ISC or will or any other World Bank affiliated fund or the CDB as a seed funder would 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 to have a, a heavy uh, environmental um, impact focus. So um, that 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 uh, I, I think even though we the funding isn't that certainly isn't adequate. To deal with the issues that, that we face as a region, we do uh, private equity in particular. There's a, a heavy focus on on that area. Okay, thank you for your response, uh, Mr. Gittins. And um, we have a third question here from Mr. Keith Maynard, and Mr. Maynard asks. What is the current size of the private funding sector in the region? And looking at funds under management, are there any plans to for adding crowdfunding to the private funding ecosystem? He, he did ask a very difficult question there. It's, that's, as you know, um, Godfrey, that's another one of our Trinity colleagues. So, it's, I haven't been able to amalgamate, and that's part of the, part of the, um, the, the rationale for the entity that is the Caribbean Alternative Investment Association to, to build these statistics around how much funds are being mobilized and so on, because that is critical information to be able to assess the impact and the potential of, of this sector. Um, so I haven't, though I have attempted, I attempted to do so in the study, haven't been able to amalgamate the, the, the share volume of funds in the, in the region. I mean, I, all, all I can say that is in, 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 in uh, comparison to um, the developed markets is small. I mean, and that's one of the challenges um, that the region faces in attracting in international um, investment funds and international private equity players. The transactions tend to be small and small. By small, I mean the 10 million US transaction is small by international standards. It's, it's almost tiny. So 
I, I, you know, I don't have, we don't have, and stats aren't available on the total amount of funds uh, that are accessible in, in this alternative space. Um, but I do know that it is um, nowhere near what is required to to make the required impact in the region. And, and, and developing the space is, is, is acutely aware. In terms of the, 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 the cloud financing or cloud financing, as, 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 um, there's one jurisdiction that has experimented with it, which is uh, the Bahamas, as I mentioned. They may have had two or three transactions or financing transactions, maybe no more than three. Um, it is an area that, um, the, the part of the challenge is that, uh, and that, and this relates to the lack of legislative support and so on. So part of the challenge is that there's no legislation around this activity, and that has to be developed so that it, it's it's done in a structured and investors are protected, and there's a transparency around transactions. So um, the first challenge is to kind of build the legislative infrastructure that would support viable. Um, cloud financing or cloud financing um, um, activity in the in the region. Um, so I would say that is that is a pretty underdeveloped area in the region, and uh, and there's much opportunity for development of, of, of that area. Okay, moving on, uh, my colleague. Robert Stewart, Dr. Robert Stewart, he asks, are the policies around public-private partnerships developing in the Caribbean to attract effect PPP financing and project management engagement to support large-scale projects such as infrastructure financing? Oh, I think, um, I don't know, I think perhaps it should read, are there policies around public-private partnerships developing in the Caribbean to attract uh, PPP financing and project management engagement to support large-scale projects such as infrastructure financing? I think there was a little typo when I read it, so. Right. Um, just, um, just assuming that we are, we are talking about um, by territory, territory by territory, it certainly isn't a regional sort of um, policy perspective on, on PPPs. Um, so region by region, of course, um, the approach to PPPs has been ad hoc, I would say. The jurisdiction that is most attuned to um, a structured approach and the advantages of a structured approach of the PPPs, in my view, is in the DR, where there is there appears to be uh, quite high state awareness of uh, the potential for using for channeling private funds towards uh, projects that could be that 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 could be. Uh, Part of a partnership between the state and and the and the private sector in achieving the country's objectives with respect to the uh, development of the tourism infrastructure, um, low 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 cost housing, um, um, high value housing, and so on. Um, so, the a lot of the legislative developments in that particular country in that particular jurisdiction in the DR have reflect uh, what they see as the importance of developing a, a viable PPP approach to, 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 to move in their, their infrastructure needs up, 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 up the scale. Uh, uh, otherwise, and elsewhere in the Caribbean, it's, I would say it's pretty ad hoc. There's no, there's no policy or structure around it. I mean, um, so what happens is businesses, season a business uh, opportunity with approach the government on a piece by piecemeal basis with 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 uh, these and with transactions and the government would assess governments, regional governments would assess on a on a on a piece by piece basis. So there's no government driven 
policy perspective, and there's no legislation support for, for that either. Um, and that certainly is something that's that's required, especially in terms of diversification, the required diversification initiatives um, in the region. I hope I answered the question um, that was asked. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gittens. Um, of course, we have, we have some comments coming forth. Um, certainly, one of them from Ugo Ikimba. Ex excellent, excellent presentation, Mr. Gittens. And then I think he also says thank you, um, Hin, with respect to responding to the question on venture capital. The next question to be that is posed comes from Mr. Brett McIntosh, and he asks, what opportunities do you see for private equity cross-border transactions? Please also share your knowledge of any successful deals. Um, well, I kind of, so, so there was one, I don't know if I can, I would have presented one slide that sort of outlined from a market perspective, and this is market participants actually in the in the various territories that, with knowledge of of the markets and so on, who who would have identified opportunities as they saw them. So I don't know if I could go back to that slide and 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 kind of outline um, the opportunities, which really in the area of, of um, export-oriented, light, light ma ma manufacturing, um, always opportunities in agri agriculture, but more so agri-processing in the region. Um, I think, um, especially for the smaller economies, niche tourism, so you don't have the land space and so on, but you have the, the other ingredients to offer medical and health uh, tourism opportunities or eco tourism opportunities or sports tourism or events based tourism we have lots of carnival related events that are that 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 are that that can be expanded significantly in my view um, uh, there's a lot of focus and understandably so on renewable energy projects and so on so there are opportunities in wind solar hydro and hydrogen um, all of which require pretty substantial investments but they are uh, you know, as as the whole issue of, of of energy availability becomes more important, those projects will 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 uh, will expand. Um, fintech and e-commerce, of course. So uh, there there is a lot of um, activity and scope for growth in uh, developing. I mean, there's been a lot of projects done, but there's still scope for for more in in developing, for instance. Um, payment systems and new eco um, um, fintech based payment systems in the region and so on that would supplement and or replace traditional um, paper based payment systems. Um, MedTech, so I've seen projects, for example, that, um, that involve um, using technology to drive more efficient and more e effective delivery of medical services to a wider population and so on. Um, so lots of scope there in 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 in, in Trinidad and in the region. Um, the creative sector is still a big area and it's still, as far as I'm concerned, not maximized. I mean in Trinidad, Dr. St. Bernard, you would have you would have seen what the kind of flip that came out of the uh, when the when the when the United Nations recognized the steel pan industry, all of a sudden, all over the world, there was, um, you know, a, you know, a lot more activity around the steel pan steel pan sector, and that for an entrepreneur, in my view, creates an opportunity for for really taking it forward and so on. And I I certainly hope that that takes place, that they take advantage of this 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 current situation, but it also extends to music and to film and to fashion and so on and to art generally um 
there's always scope for, um, for projects in the indigenous food and beverage manufacture area uh, so that so that that together with with um, agri processing I think is a big opportunity um and as a, and as has been in the news recently Barbados has gone on the cannabis and this is cannabis for both medical and recreational purposes um that's going to be a big industry despite the fact that um a lot of the BF, BFI's development financial institutions are not on that bandwagon yet. That's going to change, and there's going to be real opportunities in that that particular sector, especially for medical purposes, but also for recreational purposes. So that industry, Jamaica has been in it for for the last seven to eight years, and they're and they're building up uh, market market share and market activity. Barbados has joined the bandwagon, and I'm sure that Trinidad will, 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 will join also. So, so great opportunities there, I think, in terms of in terms of um, in terms of sectors. I can't remember, I can't remember the, the second um question that was asked or the second part of the question. No one wanted to one wanted to find out what sectors and so on. But was the second part of the question? I think you're muted. Huh? Sorry, I'm about it. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think uh, I'm okay now. Yes, that's a question from Brett McIntosh that asks, "What opportunities do you see for?" Uh, private equity, cross-border transactions, and no, that wasn't that, that question. Um, which question yeah, I was that? But I think that was the question on um, climate. Question five. Question five. Just a minute. Okay, that was question five. That was that. It was. You muted again, huh, Dr. Uh, Godfrey? Yes, I think it's a Brett McIntosh's question that asks, what opportunities do you see for private equity cross-border transactions? And asking if you could share your knowledge of any successful deals. I think that was the question. Yeah, so they've been... Uh, well, uh, it's it's it's... I, I think there's a bit of sensitivity around around identifying specific transactions, but I can see that there have been successful transactions in the region in um, in 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 uh, uh, electronic payments payments processing in the medtech area. Um, there's a lot happening in the in the, in the cannabis field. Um, there, are, there have been a number of uh, successful transactions around the agro-processing and, 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 and so on. Um, uh, there, a lot of private equity players have invested in, in um, successfully in um, projects um, related to sustainable energy projects, the wind, air, um, water, um, there's there's some investment in in, in newer uh, uh, energy, so hydrogen, and so on. So uh, I think all the all all those all those areas and and and, and has have attracted investments and um, a lot of the projects are some of the projects are uh, still in the kind of building stage and so on. So they haven't gone to commercial uh, activity, but but. Um, um, those, you know, I know of a number of successful projects in, in those areas. Okay, so as we move on, as, as usual, there are some comments. All of all of the comments have been quite favorable, and one came from Ms. Shari Johnson, who has been associated with Salises in the capacity of a research assistant, research associate on a project we I'm actually overseeing on 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 the construction of a 
Comprehensive Wealth Index for Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Ms. Johnson has made a profound contribution to that exercise. She is a very talented young development economist. And she says, thanks for the informative presentation. And she had to run off to another engagement. She's no longer with us here in Salises. And I move swiftly on to a question from another Salises Research Associate, who is Miss Alicia Shepard. And she asks, what are your thoughts on the need for systemic transformation of the financing sector in the region? Um, I, I would need to understand what 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 is meant by systemic. Um, so I mean the, the way the region evolved is is that of course the commercial banking sector for all kind of reasons. I mean uh, which 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 evolved out of the trading trading activity and links in the region um, dominated and still dominates the sector. Um, uh, dominates the financial sector. So it's so it's so it's so so, so in terms of Banking support, it's 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 commercial bank and in uh, uh, bank, banks and in our Caribbean English speaking Caribbean context, a lot of essentially um, Canadian banks, um, Canadian owned banks um, that that kind of dominate the market alongside the indigenous financial institutions. Um, so most of the in most of the jurisdictions, English and, and other language speaking uh, are bank dominated, and uh, and and the capital markets are relatively underdeveloped. Uh, more the, 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 the larger economies, um, securities exchanges, but generally speaking, across the board. The activity and the and, uh, and uh, of the exchanges and the and the, uh, the level of growth of the exchanges is subdued. It's not it's not extensive. And outside of the the, the sort of public financing um, options, meaning meaning the exchange the bond and, and securities exchanges, um, while private act activity and private financing takes place, it doesn't take place to the extent that um, it, you know it, it it should in in sort of developing the the, the uh, meeting the needs of the Caribbean people. Um, so so the challenge is to is to is to um, provide is to is to is to sort of provide a, a wider variety of financing options in the region. I mean, if, if you compare, for example, the Caribbean financial sector with the with 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 the, that in the US, um, the capital markets, quantitatively speaking, is it's 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 larger, right? It, 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 you know, than they than they than they are traditional commercial banking sector. Um, so more activity takes place on public um, securities exchanges, uh, bonds, equity transactions, and and private uh, financing platforms. Then 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 that takes place in the traditional banking sector and volume wise, it's it's, it's, it's larger. So you really want to get to a stage and do so. Um, in a way that doesn't destabilize the financial sector, um, you want to get to the stage where there is a high, a larger contribution from the capital markets, larger larger activity, and from the private markets. That's 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 ideally so that um, greenfield projects, uh, as well as well established large mature companies, have. Uh, Reasonable chance of, of achieving the objectives in terms of obtaining financing. Um, and that's some distance away from where we are now. So greenfield projects are really, really challenged in terms of in terms of raising financing. Um, and um, so and 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 the, the markets and, and the, the large established companies tend to soak up the financing 
from the traditional financing sources that's that's required, and you have a situation where to facilitate growth of green of of, of small companies, you have M and A activity taking place, and the large gobbles up the small, and and that's and that's what what takes place over time. So I think that's that's that in a nutshell is kind of kind of the challenge that that it faces. It's a it's a it's a it's a challenging proposition and requires a lot of intervention in the market to 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 get to get to the get to a situation where you have a, a more balanced sort of range of options for businesses in the financing. Okay. Th thank you for that. And we move straight on to another question from Dr. Robert Stewart. And it goes as follows. There is, as usual, a preamble leading to the question. Uh, the Caribbean region is a very bank-based financial system. So banks really have to lead the way in terms of expanding private financial participation. So how are banks engaging the venture capital stage of financing in the region, given that this stage of financing yeah. is typically too high, is typically too high risk for banks' balance sheets. That's the question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the question is asked and answered. I mean. Um, I think it is not re realistic and reasonable to expect the commercial banking sector to be the be be um, be the main you know market maker financier for for startups because you know um, the you know that's that's the, on the risk spectrum. Um, the, the the companies that venture capital is investing on the risk spectrum are uh, by some distance the highest risk um, option available and banks uh, prudentially so 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 you know uh, you know can be extensively exposed to um, the high risk even if even if they, they take the, the normal precautions and so on. And potentially there are restrictions on 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 their on their exposure to, to, to high risk investment. So I um I don't see and 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 you know it's it's, it's an unrealistic proposition to to place the responsibility for developing the, the venture capital ecosystem on on banks. Um the in Trinidad, for example, the venture capital the, there was there was a lot of noise in the in the nineteen eighties around uh, developing venture capital and so on, and as as a financing option, and there was some that some some actions that were taken legislatively, and in fact, the venture capital administrator was appointed and and did some work and so on. Um, uh, so that so it it in my mind was appropriate that a government led initiative established um the the basis for a venture capital program. But ultimately, because of government's continued involvement, it it it, it kind of died because there's there's a it's difficult for um you know, political operators to um, resist the temptation to uh, to 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 um, to use the venture capital initiative to use financing for businesses to achieve political ends and so on, and that's ultimately what kind of frustrated the whole process of establishment of the venture capital program in Trinidad and and in Tobago. But so the point I'm making is, I think it's it. it I I think it should be squarely in the hands of the government to establish an entity like a development bank of Jamaica, for example, staff it appropriately with um, the, the top mind um, in you know 
create a create a requirement that 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 this organization raises closely with international agencies with expertise and and so on in these areas provide the financing that that's that's required to to allow the developmental financial institution to be effective and then step away and allow the, the business to to to, to Follow commercial and developmental financial, uh, you know, objective developmental financial uh, activities to 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 perform effectively. Uh, if it doesn't step away and 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 there's a continued kind of involvement and, and you have a situation where uh, politics becomes the, the 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 factor that that drives decisions of the event of, of of that activity, then it's doomed to fail because. You know, it's it, it, there's no way there's no way out of that. So I always I, I always in my view, um, but to develop a, a proper private financing inclusive of venture capital and private equity, I always look at the two, the two models that I look to more than anything else is the is the DBG as I call it DBG model in Jamaica combined with the approach of the DR government, the government of the Dominican Republic in providing the infrastructure, the legislative infrastructure to encourage and um and 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 license these 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 operations that I say as they as they establish. So that kind of twin approach I think could work in most jurisdictions. Um uh, but the but the requirement is that the government Intervenes when required and then steps aside when 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 appropriate. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Gittens, for your response. And time is uh, is moving ahead. We have to close off shortly. I'm actually getting instructions to bring the session to an end. Um, there are quite a few questions being posed, um, but I would give uh, preference to those uh, members of the audience who have not posed questions before in terms of the remaining questions that I will permit to be asked of Mr. Gittins. And one of those questions comes from Mr. Michael Clark, who is asking, why do shares in the Republic Bank Caribbean Equity Fund seem to be losing value if there is need for such funds? That's the question posed by Mr. Clark. Okay, I wasn't aware that the Republic Bank or the equity fund was losing value, um, but uh, um, so, the, so the equity fund really is a, is a, a you know, is a, is a sort of mix of various quoted shares. Um, yeah. Um, so it wouldn't be limited to Republic Bank shares. Um, it, it shares it would be a sort of um, a, a mix of, of of many of the shares that are listed. I imagine on the uh, it's a Caribbean equity fund. So it's probably shares that are listed on the Trinidad, Jamaica, and, and Barbados market. Um, and what has been happening recently, of course, is that. Um, those values have been fluctuating, and right now, the value of the shares on the on the mark on on those exchanges are trending down. And that tends to happen in a situation where interest rates are, are rising and so on. So, um, I I I certainly wouldn't say that value loss for that type of investment is a permanent process. Um, the 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 all the activity on the all the exchanges has been has been challenge for, for, for a little while, but these are essentially long-term investments and over the long long term um an equity investment in a mixed fund like 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 this will uh, will 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 increase in value over 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 time. So the so the the fluctuation in value is simply a function of the activity on the exchange at this time. And yeah and the exchanges have been under some some pressure partly caused by rising interest rates internationally. Okay, thank you very much. And we move straight into um, Mr. Julian Mervin, 
Didier, who asks as follows, Mr. Gittins, do you know anything about the private placement program, which is, place, which is private funding, not public, but by invitation only for sophisticated investors not dependent on any securities or SEC? Yeah, I'm not too sure if he's referring to what are called limited offerings in Trinidad and Tobago or, or exempt distributions in Jamaica, um, both of which, uh, um, uh, um, in, in both of which instances, the SEC or the Jamaica Stock Exchange or this Jamaica Security um, Administrator are involved. I mean, the, so so there's a window offered by both um regulators security regulators for um private offering of shares or debt um with the proviso that 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 um the uh, there's a limit on the amount of investors in the Trinidad case is 35 i think it may be the same in jamaica so no more than 35 individual investors can invest so-called sophisticated investors can invest in these shares. So there's no wide distribution of the shares and whatever happens to the share doesn't in, in, in impact the market. And the, there are restrictions on, well, an absolute um, um, inability to further transfer these securities upon, upon in, investment. So, so, so on those circumstances, companies, and these are companies that are not listed companies. So it can be a, 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 a company that's listed on an exchange. So it's a, it's a broker dealer or a company that's, that's not, that's unlisted can offer security to a limited, a precisely limited amount of investors who cannot transfer those shares elsewhere and, and that 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 transaction does attract this the, the level of, of of scrutiny and the level of documentation and and so on um uh, and due diligence that would normally require that would normally require for a public issue so it's a quick transaction um you don't have your your your, your, report, your reporting requirements are limited but the exposure to investors and to the market is also limited so I suspect that's what your caller is referring to, and that avenue exists in Trinidad and in and in and in Jamaica. So in Trinidad it's called a limited offering, in Jamaica it's called an exempt distribution. Okay, and I have a question here from one of our graduate students. It seems to be a relatively simple question with a simple answer. Apologies if I missed if I asked before. Sorry, apologies if asked before. What is the minimum amount an individual in Trinidad and Tobago must have to be an investor in the private equity environment? Right. So the so the so the limit the minimum threshold is established by the private equity fund. Um so it's so so there's no legislative or or, or industry based limit. Um, the private equity fund establishes its, its threshold because, of course, it wants to wants you know wants to ensure that they, they are serious investors and they and they don't want to deal with a multiplicity of investors, and uh, and that that that's 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 so that's how how it's established. That's how it's it's, it's um, established. I would say that for most of the um, transactions and regional transactions established by especially some of the regional players, they would near thresholds of 500,000 US, a million US, that kind of thing. Some may have smaller thresholds, um, but you know, it varies dependent on the policy of the of the of the private equity people. So there are no standards. Okay, and Brett McIntosh asks. What opportunities do you see for U.S. or extra-regional cross-border transactions? Please also share your knowledge of successful transactions. That sounds like a big question, the same question that was asked earlier. Well, actually, it appears 
lower down. So I, I think it's a different question, but if it's a question that you answered, we can move on to the very last question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I kind of outline the opportunities in terms of, in terms of, and those are, I mean, the, the, most of the private equity players operate in a cross-border space. So investments are not limited to any particular jurisdiction, but the opportunities that I outlined earlier in terms of various industrial sectors um, exist across the region. And as I said, um, there have been a, quite a number of successful transactions. I can't, I can't specify, I can't provide uh, confidential information on, on identifying particular transactions, but there's been quite a number of, of, of uh, successful trans. The, 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 the trick to the private equity um, 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 industry is that because, because, um, because of the extensive due diligence that takes place prior to an investment being made, and because of the fact that there's oversight, close oversight of, 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 oper of operation of portfolio company, invariably the investment return targets are met and exceeded. So it's a it's a high yield business. I mean that's that's the nature of it because you you know private equity firms go in and 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 and, and uh, engage at the board of director level to ensure that these businesses operate as efficiently as possible, and um, and that redounds to a company that is paying good dividends, that is growing, that is valuing it, its value is increasing, and so on. So that's the trick of the private equity game, and why private equity companies are have been so fabulously successful across the across the region and across and internationally. So it's so it's active management of the portfolio as against passive management of uh, of of of, uh, of uh, a la the Republic Bank or then equity fund is passive management. So they invest in a portfolio of shares and they and they monitor the activity and they reinvest and they take and so on and so on. But it's it's much more active the private equity space. Is much more active and, and and there's much closer oversight, which redounds to the benefit of everyone: the investors, the owners of the business, the private equity firm, and so on and so on. So it's quite a viable business proposition if it's done well. Okay, and Ugo Ikimba he asked a question here, and it's really looking at a list of reasons and asking, you know. Um, which of these reasons, in other words, are these the reasons why private equity and venture capital have grown slowly compared to Latin America and Africa? And the reasons are bad macroeconomic period, very low risk tolerance by pools of capital, hence more banks, venture capital follows private equity in emerging markets, so venture capital will eventually materialize. Small populations across the Caribbean, immature capital markets, private equity and apprentice business. So with few private equity or venture capital firms, the knowledge of the most, of the, the, the knowledge of the asset class has also grown slowly. Which reason is the most? And do you see this changing in the next decade and why? It's a kind of loaded question. But I think this is the last question we will be asking. Yeah, it's, I mean, so it's a com combination. I, it's difficult to kind of point out any particular uh, reason that is more um, you know, more, more, more impactful than the than the others. I think essentially this it, it at incept, it, this has to be led initially by the state, by the government. Uh, you know, and as I say, it's about ensuring that the infrastructure that you that the infrastructure that's required for development of the sector is in place. 
responsible for ensuring that the, the funding that's required is in place, ensuring that you are open to help and advise from agencies that have the expertise and done this thing in many other countries and and kind of you know kind of know what to do and so on and can can relate to your particular circumstances. Um, and then of course it's about the government standing back and allowing it to 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 proceed, only intervening when it's when it's a roadblock. So I mean all of these challenges to the region exist and but they're not they, you know, they 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 are not they they won't they won't uh, they're not they're not fatal. So so you know, um, I think the biggest issue that the region would face, if, if as we as we can across each is each border is the is the issue of size. But even that can be circumvented. You know, um, you know, even if we when we when when we get if and when we get to the stage where we are, the 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 rate of development is more even. And so on, and and some of the less developed um, uh, territories in terms of private capital market development start to catch up, and so on. Um, the, the transaction would be the, the issue would be look um, are these are these deals large enough to, to attract foreign investors, and so on. But some of our needs, especially in the area of climate resist, resilience, and so on, are uh, require huge investments. So even then you you kind of you kind of can scale up and so on and 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 you then start getting the hundred million dollar deals and two hundred million dollar deals as US of course that 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 allow private investors and international private investors to start looking your way. You know, so I think um I think you know the, the so you you need to kind of get government involved. Government providing what's required and government stepping back and so on. Government stepping back and important and realizing the importance of the of the sector to the development of the economy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gittins, for responding to the questions. And thank you to the virtual audience for posing questions and creating an environment where we have had a very interactive um, discussion very informative session as many are saying in the chat and we are at the point where we definitely have to close off i'm getting serious instructions from behind the scenes so i'm at the point where i'm going to more or less give quickly the vote of thanks and i'll do that quickly first of all all of these alices events will not be possible without the devotion and commitment of members of staff of Salises who tirelessly and conscientiously um, deliver these services to render these seminars, webinars, forums, spotlight lectures possible. These members of staff include, first and foremost, Ms. Katian Modest, who is my secretary, and she works tirelessly and most diligently to ensure that all of this happens according to plan. Ms. Modest is usually supported by Mr. Ephraim Thompson, Mr. Sheldon Warner, Mr. Leslie Brewster, and Ms. Francine Aline, who are members of Salises staff and do chip in in various ways to ensure that we have a seamless product. Also, Worthy of thanks are staff members from the marketing and communications arm of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, in particular, Ms. Josan Green, and all members of the UE marketing team who support Ms. Josan Green in producing these events. I am particularly um, heartened and really satisfied in in, 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 in superlative ways, you know, regarding the contribution of Ms. Green to all of our events. And again, as I have said for Salisa staff members, without Ms. Green, we would not have the technical support 
and of course the 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 wisdom that guides many of these events that we host here in Salise. So thanks to Ms. Green and her team from UE Marketing. I also wish today to thank Ms. Samantha Morgan, who has delivered, who has volunteered to support the production of this event. And again, as usual, from time to time, Ms. Morgan volunteers her service, and we want to thank wholeheartedly Ms. Morgan, Ms. Samantha Morgan, for her contribution to ensuring that we have had a successful event today. Of course, this event would not have been possible without the virtual audience, and especially those who have demonstrated a commitment to Salises events and diligently follow our events. I want to thank each and every one of you, and in particular, those who today made the discussion possible by posing their very interesting questions to help us understand in a greater way the complexity of the issues that surround uh, private financing for economic development in Caribbean societies. And last but not least, my dear friend, colleague, and an outstanding professional in the area of banking and finance locally, regionally, and internationally, Mr. Hayden Gittens, for sharing his wisdom with us and making today's um, proceedings one that has scaled all expectations of what we normally expect within Salises. This says volumes because Salises does indeed set very high standards. And at this point, I just want to make one last announcement. We, we expect to have a second Salises visitors uh, webinar, most likely on the 22nd of September. And that webinar will focus on artificial intelligence and its impact on societies in the Caribbean. So, and that, and that lecture would of course be delivered at, by uh, Mr. Dr. Sekou Remy, who is an outstanding IT professional based in Kenya, but he is indeed a son of the soil. And we look forward to finalizing the agreement with uh, Dr. Remy and informing you of that upcoming webinar. So having said all of this, thank you all for coming through today. I hope you really enjoyed the session. It was worthy, a worthwhile one, worthy one. And I want to thank you and wish you all the best as you go forward and do enjoy the weekend that is ahead. Thank you very much and good evening to all, good afternoon to all of you. Best wishes always.